after an initial chapter about how we got race in the first place, the succeeding chapters are all one by one about some factor that ought to have done race in, some people said, but ultimately didn't. So how can you have declarations of independence, but then have a white supremacist new society? How can you have emancipation proclamations and really spectacular constitutional change uh, in the space of six years, and then have Jim Crow shortly thereafter? Briefly, to think more precisely about the coexistence in the US of such stark and deadly racial inequalities, as I just read, with the historic triumph of an African-American presidential candidate requires that we recognize that racism is more than one thing and that we specify what has changed. The view that Obama heralds the end of race thinking in the US rests on a particular definition of racism. One, and here I think history will eventually help us, one that currently very much holds sway in the US in politics and in popular culture. Racism turns on this view on bad but disappearing individual attitudes. One thing that I take from that is that um, the longer run idea of post-racialism, the idea that eventually will be over race, at least in the hideous forms that Du Bois identifies with personal whiteness and modern racism, that that's right. That I might be arguing today that we don't automatically get there through an election or that we don't automatically get there through any easy path, but we should all realize that racism is inhuman. It's, it's not a part of the human experience in the long programmed <laughs> way that, that people think about what it means to be human. It arose at a certain time. And Du Bois then says something equally interesting. He's writing in about 1916. And he says in this article, and it's an agitational article, Du Bois's greatest insights were often in agitational uh, articles. And he says, it's a very recent thing, probably not more than 250 years old. But it's an uh, interracial rebellion of the poor that shakes the society to the level of civil war. And it's in the aftermath of that civil war that elites in Virginia begin to say, and in London, planning Virginia, begin to say, we can't have this again. We're having one revolt after another. Therefore, there's a turn to massive use for the first time of African enslaved labor instead of African enslaved labor being one small source of workers uh, as they had been to that point. But also, in the addition to the turn to African labor, a turn to a series of laws which make for distinctions between black and white, and laws which, and court cases, uh, which fundamentally solidify a system in which, for example, white women a very material system in which, for example, white women can only give birth to freedom and black women can mostly only give birth to slavery, in which not only are participants in interracial marriages severely penalized for their now crime, but the preachers who perform the marriage are threatened with banishment uh, for, for their crime. So a whole series about who can own guns, about land, about a whole variety of things develops with a certain suddenness, you could say beginning in the late 1650s, but particularly in the, late, in the 1680s and 1690s. Now, notice the problem here is not that people had bad attitudes. And my argument is that race is fundamentally not about bad attitudes and bad ideas in its first instance. It's that they had good attitudes <laughs> by our standards. They were loving each other and rebelling together and fleeing indentured servant uh, status and slavery uh, together. And that's what calls in this attempt to create division and bad uh, attitudes. 